Okay, this is the second hour of Physics 1C for November 10th. And in this problem, we are analyzing an RL circuit. So, a sensitive electronic device with a resistance of 175 ohms is to be connected to a source of EMF with negligible internal resistance by a switch. The device is designed to operate with 36 milliamps of current, but to avoid damage to the device, the current can rise to no more than 4.9 milliamps in the first 58 microseconds <laughs> after the switch is closed. It's very specific values. An inductor is therefore connected in series with the device. So the goal here is to prevent, um, it's, so it's designed to operate with 36 milliamps, but you don't want the current to rise more than 4.9 milliamps. So an inductor is therefore connected in series with the device, as in figure 30.11, which would be the figure above. So our figure is basically a resistor, an inductor, an EMF source, and a switch. And what we know is that the current can rise no more than 4.9 milliamps in 58 microseconds. We know the resistance. We also know the, this would be like the max current, I think, right? Does that seem reasonable? Um, what is the required source of EMF E? So we need to find out what this is. And we also want to figure out what L is. And then what the RL time constant is as well. Okay, what do y'all think? What's the easiest way to figure out what the, the EMF of the battery is here? Yep. So for part A, we can just do E equal to IR, as asked just in the chat. So we do E equal to the maximum current flowing in the system times the resistance. So 36 multiplied by 175. So I get 6.3 volts. Is that correct, everybody? Anyone have any questions? Okay. Part B says the inductance. How do we find L? All right, what do y'all think? How do we find the inductance L? Should we use the equation we derived in the last part? The loop. So last time we used the loop to get an equation Right? And our equation that we got was uh, related to the current as a function of time. One thing I notice here is that we know something about the current at a particular time value. So what I would say is that the current at 58 microseconds can be, what is it, no larger than 4.9, it has to be basically less than 4.9 milliamps. So if that's the maximum that the current can be at this time, I think we can just kind of fix it to that value. So I of T then is equal to basically I max or E over R multiplied by one minus E to the negative TR over L. And I believe we have all of the information we need here, and we just need to isolate L, basically. Um, 
I'm going to do this symbolically because I think it'll be a little more understandable, but I'm just going to indicate that we know this value. That's going to be this. The t is going to be 58 microseconds. So we're going to be using t equal to 58 times 10 to the negative 6 seconds. Micro is negative 6. And then we have everything else, right? We have imax from here. We have the resistance was given. And then, like I said, t is, we're going to use this value of t. And we're just going to solve for it all. So what we'll get is so it'd be i of t divided by i max uh, rearrange so it gets one minus We need to eliminate the um, the exponential term here. So we basically just multiply by the natural log for both sides. So we'll get natural log of 1 minus when you take the natural log of this, you can basically bring the um, exponent down in front and then you end up with a log of e, and the log of e is just equal to 1, so this goes away. And we're solving for l, so we end up getting, this is going to be kind of, it's going to be equal to negative t times r, and then divided by this big logarithm thing. we go. Anyone have any questions? I'm plugging all the numbers here. Were there any of the steps of that algebra that anyone found confusing? You want me to go back through? I think sometimes I skip steps that other people would do and I'm not trying to be confusing. I know you don't do a lot of logarithm stuff with your algebra very often. Okay, the current at 58 microseconds is 4.9 milliamps. So that's going to be 1 minus 4.9. No, oh, actually, it's a ratio, isn't it? So we could just write 4.9 milliamps and then divide by I max, which was 36 milliamps. And the, the units will cancel anyway, so don't have to worry about plugging those in. And that should be equal to our inductance. We can check to make sure it has the right units. I think I said earlier that inductance, that 1 Henry for inductance is equal to 1 ohm times second. And you can see that show up here, ohm times seconds. This is something that's going to be relevant in uh, the next chapter uh, when we talk about alternating current, because it's not it's not a mistake, or it's not a... It's not an accident that there's an ohm second that shows up in here. Um, and we're going to learn that there's a way you can actually write inductance just in ohms using a, a, something that's called uh, inductive reactance. Something that those of you that have done things with electronics may, may know something about. And um, we can generalize resistance into something that's called um, impedance or impedance, uh, which has units of ohms. And we can do it for capacitors too. Anyway. Uh, someone want to calculate this? Tell me what y'all get. I'll do it as well. Impedance. No, it's it's I M P E D, not that one. I M P E D A N C E. That's why I said impedance. I think it makes sense to pronounce it like that. Point oh six nine four. At least if I agree. Yeah, that's how you spell it. Thank you, Mr. Meowers. I assume that the logarithm is going to give us a negative sign to deal with that negative sign there. 1 minus 4.9 divided by 36. Point oh six nine three. I agree. Isn't that like natural log 2? Point oh. Is it natural log 2, like uh, 0.693? Let me see. Let 
It is. Is it? A... Yeah. So somehow all these things are going to end up canceling out that this is log 2 over 10. That's interesting. I only remember that because there's these things that show up in... Oh, let me stop for a second before I start saying a bunch of weird stuff. Do you guys have any questions? Natural Log 2 just shows up a bunch. And I, I remember it showed up a bunch in um, the field that I was working in, in quantum field theory. We were taking this course. And there were all these there were all these um, equations that we would have that would have 0.693 show up in them. Um, and they involved doing these, uh, this, this process called renormalization, where you're eliminating infinities and you do these things where you do infinity minus infinity and you'd get logged to every time. It's really kind of weird. I still don't really understand what we were doing at the time, but, uh, yeah. So that's the RL circuit. And I, I kind of want to come back and talk about this again, because I think some people would say I was lying to you. Oh, part C? Sorry, part C is really easy. What is the RL time constant? So part C, thank you for reminding me. So tau, the RL time constant, was uh, L over R. So it's equal to 0. 0.0693 Henry's divided by the resistance, which was 175 ohms. I got 3.96 times 10 to the negative 4, I believe. That's what that is. And that's in seconds. You guys agree? Did I pull a Newton on you? Why was it pulled a Newton? What do you mean? What is, what's, what's pulled a Newton? Cheating? Wait, so what? how did Newton lie? What did Newton, Newton lie about? Oh, gravity. See, it's, it's not lying if you don't know that you're wrong, though. It's not lying if you don't know that you're wrong. What about momentum? Newton was just wrong, basically. Where'd the one come from? For which part? Uh, this one? Oh, sorry. That's Henry's. That's a unit. Yeah, my bad. That's that's just Henry's right there. Yeah. Oh, relativistic momentum. Yeah. Again, I don't. I don't think. Yeah, Newton was wrong about momentum, but at the same time, I don't. He didn't really have any reason to know anything about relativity. Um, because uh, electromagnetism hadn't been discovered yet, right? So the advantage that Einstein had on Newton was that um, Maxwell had already written his equations down, right? So Einstein had, uh, he had Maxwell and he had Newton. So he had, all, he had all of classical physics. And in addition to that, he also knew about the um, um, interferometer experiments, uh, or more specifically, the interference effects. Um, and uh, was I talking about this in this class, or was I talking about this in the physics club? I can't remember. A few weeks ago, we were talking about relativity. But, um, I, th I think I mentioned it to you, at least. Either way, the the thing about Einstein was he... So we know enough... Of, I think we know enough now that we can actually talk about this. Talk about relative motion. Um, it's really interesting to talk about. I, I'm very... Okay, I, I want to I wanna talk about this first, and then we can come back and talk more about Einstein and Newton. But, um, you know, Einstein went into his theory of relativity knowing that there's this fundamental issue within electricity and magnetism. You know, the interesting thing about electricity and magnetism is that you don't need to change it with relativity. I don't know if that's something you guys have been talking about in your, in your 1D class, but since I think a lot of you are probably taking Dr. Coronius, you probably have talked about it that the equations of 1c don't have to be fixed for relativity. I don't know if you guys knew that, but Maxwell's equations work with relativity. They're, they're relativistically sound, meaning 
that the laws of Newton and the laws of like Galileo, those have to be altered due to special relativity when you start to travel really close to the speed of light. But that does not have to happen for um, uh, electricity and magnetism, which is really interesting. And yeah, does that make any sense? Okay, let's talk about this equation right here. How did we get this equation? We got this equation because we used Kirchhoff's laws, right? But I think that there is a little bit of a lie inside of this. When we learned Kirchhoff's laws, we were talking about basically just resistors, right? We were talking about EMF sources, and we were talking about resistors, right? And there's actually a law that's kind of bigger than Kirchhoff's law, and that law is Faraday's law. So if you take our same circuit, and I want to I want to kind of redraw our circuit in the following way. So our circuit has an EMF source, right? And that EMF source is connected to a resistor. And then that resistor is connected to a solenoid of some kind. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw our solenoid kind of like this and say that it has a lot of turns in it. Um, it, it kind of coils around like this. So that's our solenoid. That's our inductor. And then it connects back up to our battery source right here, right? So that's this is our inductor L right here. And it's basically a solenoid. There's our resistor R. And we say we close some switch, right? So we, we have a switch in here as well. Let's draw, click this. We've got a switch in the system. And what we'll do is we'll basically, we're going to close the switch at t equal to 0, right? Now, we used Kharkov's law before. But um, but we're going to use um, we're going to use Faraday's law now to to look at what you get from Faraday's law. Faraday's law. You'll notice that Kirchhoff's laws is not one of Maxwell's equations, right? Remember last time we discussed what Maxwell's equations are. Was it last time? Yeah, there they are. And there's Faraday's law right there, right? You don't see Kirchhoff's laws anywhere on this, right? There's no Kirchhoff law, right? Well, it turns out that Kirchhoff's law is a special case of Ampere's law, and I'll kind of show you that. Not Ampere's law, this is this is Faraday's law. I'll show you what I mean by that. So um, what Faraday's law says is that if I integrate uh, e dot dl, that what I get by doing that is the time rate of change of flux, so negative in multiplied by uh, the flux this right here, right? All right. So um, what if we apply this to our equation right here? All right. So what I would say is that if I do the integral of e dot dl, and I do it around a closed loop, that, that closed loop could be something like we go from point A here, and then we go around a loop like this. And that, of course, includes going around this loop and then back to here too, right? So that's our loop now. for this, because this is a loop integral. It's a, it's a line integral that has a, it's a closed line integral. So I would say that when we go from this point to this point and we do e dot dl, what we're going to get is the EMF e, all right? Within this uh, system right here, there's, there's going to be some electric field that points this way. And uh, when we do e dot dl right here, I'm saying we're going to get e. So the, the first term we're going to get here is going to be e. And then we get to this point right here, and we're going in this direction here. Um, we're going to get the, the my, there's, there's current flowing now, right? Current I. And E dot DL. Really, E dot DL is kind of like an EMF, if you think about it, because it's basically just E times L. So what we would get inside of here would be um, plus kind of the, the electric field that we would have inside of here multiplied by kind of the length of how long this is right here, right? But that can actually be written in a different way, because inside of a... Um, in, in, when you have a kind of a straight electric field, we've said in the past that the, the electric field was equal to basically just delta V between the ends divided by L, but there's a negative sign that shows up here. So you, you divide by L and multiply by, I should use, I should be careful here because big L represents the inductance, right? So if you do E times L, but this is negative V over L, which is actually going to end up just being negative E over L, then you end up getting um, basically I times R over L, and that cancels out with the L. So this whole thing right here just becomes exactly what we got from Kirchhoff's laws. You get negative, uh, negative IR, basically. Okay, 
what do you get on the right hand side on the right hand side we've got this negative sign that shows up right and we've got the flux right now something to something to point out right here um we have this term right here that shows up because there's a resistor right um what about the inductor do you think the inductor could have resistance what do you think Absolutely, right? It has to have resistance, right? There's only one way it would not have resistance, and that's if it's a superconductor, right? Because it's it's a big coil of wire. And it's a if it's a big coil of wire, then um well, we we learned that, you know, resistance is equal to rho L over A, right? The longer that it is. And depending on what the what the material is, there's some resistivity. And the area here is the cross-sectional area of the inductor. And yeah, so you you, you should technically get some uh so then so then in reality we should probably have another term actually on the left hand side over here and what that term would be would be something like minus uh i times little r or something where this would be the resistance of the solenoid right something like the resistance of the solenoid but what if we say that the resistance of the solenoid is zero because after all that's what we did in the previous problem right we didn't include another term right here, right? We just said E minus IR and then minus L D I D T, right? We didn't include that term. So in a way, in the in the problem we did before, we were looking at basically kind of a perfect, um, a perfect, uh, um, what's it called? Kind of a perfect solenoid uh, in the sense that it, it must have, it must be a superconductor or something like that, right? So what does that mean about this term then for the solenoid? This term for the solenoid basically says that you need to do E dot DL. So, so here's a question to think about. If the solenoid is actually a superconductor, what does that mean about the electric field inside the solenoid? Can there be an electric field inside the solenoid if, there's, if, it's, if it's a superconductor? What do you think? What do y'all think? Can there be an electric field inside of a superconductor in a system like this? Miara says no, but he puts a question mark, which I think is indicative of, yeah, not really fully understanding, but, but kind of on the right track. Why not? Why wouldn't there be an electric field? Because if there was an electric field, it, we'd have to do this, right? We had to do E dot DL. We would do E times the length of the solenoid, right? You said all the electric current goes into being in the wire since there's no resistance, yeah. So I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna think about an analogy that I think can help to understand what's happening here. What is the resistor like? Okay, so imagine that I've got a surface, okay? And on this surface, what I have, just like good physics 1A problems, there's there's a portion of, of, my, um, of my surface between, we're gonna call this point A and point B right here, and that portion has friction. But every other piece of the wire does not have friction, right? And then I want to think about what happens when a box moves across this, right? So I've got a box that's moving to the right with some velocity v. It encounters this place where there's friction. As a result of encountering that friction, it feels a force, right? And what kind of force does it feel? Well, it feels a force that's equal to, you know, if we think about the direction of motion as v, it's going to feel a force that's kind of like negative friction for, I mean, how do we write it? It's like negative, negative f or something like that, right? And I, I want to think about this in the following sense. Imagine that we, we think about this in a way that we can compare to that IR term right there. So let's let's think about this as if it's um, if it's a it's a force of friction that's kind of dependent on velocity, kind of like drag is basically, right? So we're going to say it's something like a force that's equal to uh, negative b times the velocity or something like that, right? Where b here is going to represent kind of like just some constant that relates the velocity to the force. Okay, Th this is this is what this term is like right here. Negative IR is saying that um, you have the EMF, which is a type of moving force that pushes the electrons, and those electrons uh, kind of get slowed down in a way uh, by this resistor, right? Okay, and so the um, the box comes out the other side with some new speed V prime, and V prime ends up being less than V, right? But then what happens as it goes across the rest of the circuit? If there's if there's no resistance in our solenoid here. That would be like this box traveling along a surface where there's basically no um, there's no forces that it would feel, right? 
so that by the time it came out this side right here, it would be it would have been moving along a frictionless plane the entire time, feeling no forces of any kind, right? Now, in order to make this a, a good comparison, what we need to do is we need to replace this with like a positive electron, positron, uh, because the the motion of this box is like a motion of charges within the circuit. See, once they get to the solenoid, if in fact it has no resistance at all, then they're just going to kind of freely move through here, not feeling any forces at all. No electric fields. No electric field. So we say the electric field inside of the superconductor is going to be zero. The charges neither speed up nor slow down due to the superconductor. Does that make sense? See, the EMF source is the place where the charges speed up, right? And then the resistor is the place where the charges slow down. So it's, it's reasonable to think that you have electric fields in those locations, right? Because an electric field is the thing that actually works on the charges, right? Within this region, you've got an electric field that kind of is opposing your motion in a way and slows you down. But then when you get to this region over here, it's just like a, it's like a slip and slide. You're just going to zip around and then you come out the other end, right? So the, the idea that you should put what we did before, the idea that you should put this this term on the left-hand side of the equation is a little bit misleading because in reality, those terms are coming from doing this loop thing and there is there is no electric field inside of something if you're saying that it has no resistance, basically. So the inductor should have shown up in our equation on the right-hand side over here. And if we do it properly, it will work out just fine. So in this case, what we do is we say we need to do d phi dt. There is a current that's flowing in the system right here that current is changing in time. In fact, it's increasing, right? And because it's increasing in time, that's where this negative sign here is, right? So let's let's do this. Um, there's there's N turns on our solenoid. The the flux inside of a solenoid is related to the um, the inductance because we had this equation that was like inductance was equal to N times the flux divided by the current, right? So we can kind of rewrite this so that the flux would be equal to what would it be? Li divided by n, right? So let's put that in here. Let's pull the L out, leave the I inside because the current is changing, cancel the ends. Uh, so it ends up being negative L times di dt. Now we got to think about this. The current is increasing in this system, right? If it's an increasing current, then it makes sense that this negative sign should stay here then, right? So that's the equation that we would get using Faraday's law. And actually, if you rearrange this, I don't think you get the same thing we had above. Unless I'm misunderstanding what I need to do with this negative sign here. Should this negative sign be here in this case? Not the same? What are you saying? Yeah, it's definitely not the same, right? Because we put a minus sign in here. And if we hadn't done that, we would not have gotten the right answer. So... I need to think about this. Why does it end up becoming plus on this side now? I gotta look something up here. Let's look at Maxwell's equations real quick. Really very well. all. Make sure I actually wrote it down right. No, there's a negative sign there. Right there. So that's right. Maybe I needed to put a negative sign inside of here. Maybe because of the flux being like B A cosine theta. Let's think about this. The current's flowing this way. Huh. There's a way to do this where you get the same sign. But I still emphasize that uh, this is a better way to think about it, even though I got the wrong answer. I need to think about this. Sorry, I'm not trying to confuse you. I thought this was actually going to work out. I thought there was a reason why the negative went away here. And off the top of my head, I'm not remembering why that is. The e dot tl for this one is positive e. The only other possibility would be that you need a negative sign here and a positive sign here. That 
doesn't make sense. Is the EMF inside, is the electric field inside of the... Maybe I got the electric field direction wrong for the battery. I think I did. I think both of these I got wrong. Because if you think about what's going on with the battery, the positive side is here and the negative side's here, right? And it goes from positive to negative, exactly. The E should be this way, right? And then the E here is actually this way, right? Yeah, so I think what I did wrong was this should have been negative and this should have been positive. Negative, positive, and then it works out actually. That's the same equation, right? I think this EMF should have been down. The electric field going this way and this should have been negative, positive, positive, which is the same thing as the equation we had before. All of this is to say is that uh, getting to this equation is not easy. It seems kind of easy with the way I did it earlier, right? Because um, I kind of just glossed over it and said, like, use Kirchhoff's laws. And this is what your textbook does. This is what almost all textbooks do. But I think this is probably a place where the textbook is kind of cheating a little bit because I think they know what the right answer is supposed to be. You know? Does that make any sense? I think they kind of know this is what you're supposed to get. Because the reality is that this is the more fundamental equation. And Kirchhoff's laws... So Kirchhoff's laws are the special case when this is equal to zero. But this is only true if you have a system in which the currents aren't changing. Because as soon as you have changing currents, then you get EMFs that are induced that you have to you have to take account for. Well, so there you go. I probably confused you all a lot, and I apologize if I did, but I'm just trying to kind of open your eyes to the idea that the way that the textbook does things sometimes, it might not completely sync up with, um, if you think deeply enough about it, it might not completely sync up with what's going on. And this is not the only place that they do this. I also kind of cheated you in a way when we were talking about um, the capacitance uh, circuits. So it was like an RC circuit where we did something kind of similar. If you start to ask a lot of questions about that, I think you, you kind of lead down to kind of similar paths. So. Uh, whereas if you think about it this way, I think you get it right most of the time, even though I messed it up here. I think it's largely because I uh, didn't review this before class. Your book doesn't talk about this, obviously, right? So uh, the first place I read about this was uh, in uh, lecture notes from a course at Yale that I was looking through when I was prepping. And I need to go back and make sure that I did it right. But I do believe that the core of what I was doing wrong was this piece right here, that the electric field inside of the, the source right here has to be pointing backwards so that you get the negative and the positive. Anyway, anyone have any questions? The IR, right here. So to get the IR, uh, let's think about the, so this is our resistor, right? And um, we're going from point A to point B. Um, current flows in this system from A to B, so the current's going this way. That implies that there has to be an electric field within the system that goes in the same direction, right? So the electric field has to be pointing uh, left to right as well. So we've got an electric field that goes that way. And what we can say is that if the length of our inductor between these two points is L, then what we would write down would be just E times L. This would be positive. And then what we do is we think, well, what is E times L? Well, E times L is actually the same thing um, as delta V which is equal to E times L in this case, which is gonna be equal to the EMF basically, or more particularly, this is equal to I times R when we're talking about a, uh, um, I don't know if this is something you remember, but our definition of what Delta V is, is basically the integral of E dot DL. And in this case, the electric field inside of our inductor, inside of our resistor would be constant. So it would just become E times L. 
And that has to be the same thing as i times r, basically. So the el basically just becomes i times r. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, let's talk about something else uh, that was related to something that kind of came up during the discussion. You we were mentioning Einstein, and so um, I think it's relevant to kind of mention this just because. So let's think about the following scenario. I have a wire that carries current I. Okay. And I have near this wire a uh, positive charge. What happens to this positive charge if it has a velocity equal to zero when it's placed near this current carrying wire? Does it feel any forces? Ty is right, it does not feel any forces. The force on this, this object would be equal to zero. There would be no electric force. There would be no magnetic force, right? Okay. No forces. At rest, no forces, right? Okay. Now, if I take the exact same scenario, so I've got my current carrying wire. It has a current I. I place next to it a charge Q. And I say, okay, this charge moves with a velocity V. How about now? Is there going to be a force on this wire? Or, sorry, a force on the charge? There is, right? What is the force? It's the Lorentz force, right? Fb is equal to qv cross b. We need to know something about the direction of the magnetic field at this location. What's the direction of the magnetic field down here where this object is? What would it be? So Ty said up. Do you guys agree? What's the direct? Oh, so up was the force, right? What's the direction of the magnetic field? into the board, exactly. So all along the bottom down here, we have a magnetic field. It goes into the board. And then if you do your V cross B, you get a magnetic force that's up like this, right? So in this picture, what we would say is that the, the charge experiences a magnetic force. So next, um, let's see if I can get this part right. There's two different ways to do this. How would this look if you were moving with the charge? Does that make sense? How would this look if I'm in a car and I'm observing what's happening in the system? I can see this charged particle somehow. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a beam of charged particles. I don't know. What would happen if I was moving at the same velocity as the particle? It looks like the charge isn't moving, right? Yeah. What I would see is the wire moves to the left, basically. And it looks like the charge isn't moving. What would I, what would I say is happening to that charge? First of all, would the charge still experience a force upwards, even if I was moving alongside it? What do you think? Has to, right? One of the rules about physics is that as long as you perform an experiment in one reference frame, and if you move to another reference frame that's moving at constant velocity relative to it, the, the laws of physics basically can't change. Um, so. If one observer that's at rest relative to the charge says that it experiences a magnetic force, uh, the other observer at least has to say that the charge moves up, right? The charge is attracted to the wire, right? But 
how would how would this person calculate it? Certainly this equation wouldn't work anymore, right? Would it would this equation still work? How can we make it so that this equation suddenly starts working again? What moves with negative v, Mr. Meowers, in this case? B is related to the distance from the wire. The wire moves to the left, right? Yeah. So the wire is moving left. So relative to me and the charge, the wire is moving, right? So we could go back to our original picture right here, where we had the, the charge not moving, and say... Scenario, like if we call this like scenario A and we call this scenario B or something like this. Then in scenario B, basically what's happening is like the wire is moving, right? So it's kind of like the wire is moving this way. And if the wire moves relative to the charge, well, then the charge is still moving inside of a magnetic field, right? I mean, after all, this magnetic field is definitely still here in the upper case, right? So this person could say, okay, well, it's it's the reason why it's being attracted is because the wire is moving left relative to the charge and a wire moving to the left is certainly the same thing as a charge moving to the right, right? So if the wire moves relative to the charge, it's the same idea, right? Does that make sense? So the charge is attracted to the wire, and again, this person can say by a magnetic force, and this particular magnetic force would be produced by the fact that the, the wire is now moving left relative to the charge. Does that make sense? So there's still motion. There's relative motion, right? So even though it looks to me as if the charge is sitting still, there's relative motion. So we can understand how there's a magnetic force that's produced, basically. Because it's effectively like this magnetic field is moving to the left relative to the... Is everyone okay with that? So in both cases, you'd say magnetic force. Okay, what about the following scenario, then? What if we change it like this? What if we, what if we get really specific about what's going on here? So what is current? Electric current is the idea that within a, a system, uh, what you have is moving charges, okay? And what I'm going to do, just to make things simple here, I'm going to say that this wire is composed of positive charges, and these are going to be our charge carriers. We know that in reality, electrons are the things that move, and that's whatever. But we've got all these charge carriers inside of our, our object, right? What if we do this? What if we say these charged particles are all moving with the drift velocity that we call V sub D, right? They're all moving to the right with this, this kind of average drift velocity that we call VD. In reality, they're kind of bouncing around all over the place, right? So now what we do is we take our positively charged particle. And of course, within our wire, there's also negative charges, right? The wire's neutral, so for every positive charge, you need a negative charge. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to say take a positively charged particle, okay? And say that it moves to the right, but it moves with the exact same drift velocity. So as the charged particles within the wire are moving to the right, the positively charged particle out here is also drifting to the right as well at the same speed, okay? So they both move at the same speed, right? And in addition, me and my car is going to creep along at exactly the same speed. Now, the drift velocities are extremely low, but with everything moving with the same speed, right? What's going to happen now? Is this particle going to feel a force? And if so, how could we explain it? What do I say about the current in this wire when I when I'm when I'm moving at the same speed as the as the charges in the wire? Is there a current now? Do I observe a current in that wire? Does the question make sense? <laughs> It looks like the charges aren't moving, right? When you say it, you mean the charges in the wire? Yeah. That's exactly right, Mr. Meowers. That's the key thing here. It looks like nothing's moving, but we know there is a magnetic field here, right? When I say we, I mean us that's not moving, okay? The observer that's at, that's at rest, so if I've got an observer over here that's at rest relative to the system, is going to say, there's an electric current. 
it doesn't matter if this particle moves at exactly the same speed as those charges. There's an electric current, right? This guy says, oh, do a thought bubble here. He says, yeah, there's, there's a current that flows through this wire. And because there's current, that leads to a magnetic field. And because there's a magnetic field, that leads to a magnetic force. He's going to say, okay, there's a magnetic force that makes the thing look like this, right? Now, I'm in another system, and I'm moving relative to the charge. I'm, I'm moving at the same speed, so it looks like the charge is at rest. So this person says that the velocity of the charge is equal to zero. Okay, because, it's, it's because I'm moving with it. And this person would also say that the current is zero, which means the magnetic field is zero. But nonetheless, this person has to observe the exact same reality. After all, how can it be the case that this person that's sitting here observes the this, this charged particle to be attracted, but the person that moves with it says there's no current, there's no magnetic field, and the charge isn't moving, so I don't I have I have no magnetic field, I have no velocity, so how do I have a force? But nonetheless, it would have to I mean, how how after all, how could this person say anything other than the, that the charge is attracted? If this guy says that's sitting at rest relative to the wire, if this guy says that uh, the the charge is attracted, right? Then this person has to observe the same thing. This way, this person would be like, well, B is zero and I is zero and, and V is zero, yet the force is not equal to zero. The force is up. You guys see the dilemma? Does it make sense? Am I confusing you? So what would cause that what would cause that force from this moving observer's perspective? What could what could cause it? What what, what are the possibilities? What what are the two things that can make a charge move? Okay, gravity could be one of them possibly. The wire moving left may have something to do with it, but I don't immediately see what it would be. You gotta, you gotta kind of like think. So, what are the things that we know can actually cause charges to move in this class? What do we learn in one C? What are the things that can make a charge move? Charge plates. What do, what do charge plates do? What do they produce? They produce electric fields, right? They produce electric fields, right? Now, in the scenario that we're looking at here, basically everything's sitting still. Everything is sitting still. Except for one thing, these negative charges are technically moving to the left a little bit here. But what I would argue is that this person would have to reason that the force is not zero because there's an electric field. There must be an electric field. After all, that's the only thing that can possibly be doing it. There must be some kind of an electric field. Where does it come from? I don't know. You gotta take physics 1D to figure out where it comes from. But the idea here is that it's possible that in one frame of reference you observe a magnetic field and in another frame of reference you observe an electric field. Right? Because the general equation for forces is force is equal to Q times E plus V cross B. That face when you finish special relativity and still have no idea. You probably have some idea, but you're probably just not immediately thinking about it. That feel win, that face win, what's the difference? I always thought TFW was that face win, but anyway. Um, so the idea here would be that like this person looks at what's happening and he says there's an electric field. This person looks at what's happening and says there's a magnetic field. And this kind of like thought experiment, I guess you could call it, is designed to help you to think about the idea that um, electric and magnetic fields can be relative. Electric, it's not because they're oscillating. No, it's because of length contraction. It's because of length contraction. Um. We could watch a video that would explain this way better than I'm explaining it, actually. Um, if you guys want to, from uh, PBS FaceTime, if you want. Do I do that? It's really short. 
this is going to go into the relativity stuff here. So if you don't know much about relativity, uh, it's okay. But I, I will say that this idea that one observer would observe an, a magnetic field, but another observer might observe an electric field is um, supposedly, and I don't know if this is 100% accurate, what drove Einstein to realize that, um, uh, well, I'll put it in a different way. Einstein knew from thinking about this that an electric field was just a magnetic field in motion and vice versa, basically. And that's what he used to um, uh, kind of formulate his special theory of relativity. Let's see if I can find this. So it's actually, it's not space-time, it's veritasium. So it's like, uh, magnetic fields. I should find it. Yeah, that's it. This is seven years old. And there's a commercial for the Mandalorian. Okay. It's a really short video. A lot of nice animations here, too. Uh, here we go. May, let me know if the sound's not working. Only a few elements can be permanent magnets. Iron is one. Copper is not. But if you pass an electric current through any metal, it becomes a magnet. An electromagnet. But how does this work? Well, strangely enough, it's a consequence of special relativity. Special relativity is the fact that in our universe, length and time aren't absolute. They're perceived differently by observers moving relative to each other, hence relativity. For example, if you measure carefully enough, you'll find that time passes slower for observers moving relative to you. Hey Derek, when did you last shave? Six hours ago. Actually, it was five hours, 59 minutes, and 59.9999999999. And moving objects are also contracted in their direction of motion. You're looking slim, only in your frame of reference. So when an object is moving relative to you, it actually takes up less space than when it's not moving. And even though this effect is obviously way tinier than we've shown, length contraction is what makes an electromagnet work. Picture a copper wire. It consists of positive metal ions swimming in a sea of free negative electrons. Now the number of protons is equal to the number of negative electrons, so overall the wire is neutral. So if there were a positive charge or positively charged cat nearby, it would experience no force from the wire at all. And even if there were a current in the wire, the electrons would just be drifting in one direction, but the density of positive and negative charges would still be the same, and so the wire would be neutral, so no force on the kitty. But what if the cat starts moving? Imagine for simplicity that the cat is moving in the same direction as the electrons with the same velocity. Well now, in my frame of reference, the wire is still neutral and so there should be no force on the cat. But consider the same situation in her frame of reference. In the cat's frame of reference, the positive charges in the wire are moving, so according to special relativity, their separation will be ever so slightly contracted. Also, from this perspective, the electrons aren't moving, so they'll be more spread out than before. Remember, objects take up more space when they're not moving than when they are. These two changes together mean there's a higher density of positive charges in the wire, so it's no longer neutral, it's positively charged which means that the positively charged cat will feel a repulsive electric force from the wire. But in my frame of reference, this seems mysterious. There's no force on a stationary charged cat, but a moving cat is somehow repelled from this neutral wire. How do you account for that force? Well, we say it is the magnetic force. And that's mainly because a wire with current in it deflects nearby magnets. So really what this experiment shows is that a magnetic field is just an electric field viewed from a different frame of reference. In the cat's frame of reference, it is repelled from the wire due to the electric field created by the excess positive charges produced by the effects of length contraction. In my frame of reference, the cat is repelled from a neutral wire due to the magnetic field created by the current flowing in the wire. So whether you see it as an electric or a magnetic field just depends on your frame of reference, but in either case, the results are the same. So an electromagnet is an everyday example of special relativity in action. Now that might seem crazy since electrons drift through wires at about 0.00000000001% the speed of light. So how can special relativity have anything to do with it? 
Well, the truth is there are enough electrons in a wire and the electric interaction is so amazingly strong that even the minuscule effects of length contraction can produce significant charge imbalances that produce a noticeable force. So special relativity explains electromagnets, but what about permanent magnets? Yeah, I mean, there can't be electrical currents flowing around inside lumps of rock, can there? Click here to go to Minute Physics where we'll explore magnetite, compasses, and all the wizardry of permanent magnets. Y'all have any questions? Those of you that are taking 1D, does it, does it click for you now? It's pretty amazing. I mean, it's utterly amazing. If you haven't taken 1D, just when you get there, you'll, you know, you can go read about special relativity and read about length contraction. Um, let me change windows again. But yeah, like, again, I, uh, I think a copy of Einstein's book is at, is at work or his paper. Um, so I probably should go get that. But there, there's, there's, there's things that he says within his paper that make it pretty clear that, that this is something he thought about specifically. Where are we at? Note. Does our textbook explicitly talk about how the electric field and the magnetic field depend on reference frame? I don't think your textbook does. Um, but what you can do, uh, let me find it. If you can find your 1C lab manual, I'm going to grab mine one second. So if you look in your 1C lab manual and you go to uh, it's like the very end. Let me see real quick. It's right before the problems start. I'll get you the actual number of the page. The way that this book is uh, organized is kind of weird. So let's see. I don't know. Now I can't find it. Maybe it's before this. Appendix D. Huh. There it is. Appendix J. Appendix J is where it is. E, F, G, H. Oh, it's after the problems. There it is. At the very end, after you, after you get through all the problems, there's appendix I, which is on the Betatron, and there's an appendix J. And you can actually go through the calculation yourself. So if you're taking one, um, if you're taking one D and you and you understand relativity, you can actually go through the calculation and, and prove exactly how it works. Um, so it's called appendix J says the magnetic field from a relativistic transformation. So if you want to read that, Ash, I highly recommend it. It's really short, actually. It's only two pages, actually. So it's like one and a half pages in reality. So if you can find that, I don't know. I don't know if any of you actually pulled up your lab manual, but it's appendix J in the lab manual is where you can find the calculation where you prove that uh, the magnetic field is just a relativistic transformation in the electric field. So what I was trying to say about Einstein, this is what made Einstein realize that relativity was something he needed to look into, if that makes any sense, was the realization that that when you think about systems like this, that that um, the electric field and the magnetic field must just be just what different observers see, right? Because, you know, he realized that when objects start to move relative to each other, people observe different things, right? I can give you a really simple example. Suppose that you're in the back of a truck. This is something you may have seen in Physics 1A. You're in the back of a truck, right? And um, you've got a baseball, and you take that baseball, You're move the truck's moving, okay? You throw the baseball straight up in the air, it falls back down to your hand, right? In your frame of reference, it looks like the baseball went straight up and straight down, right? But from the frame of reference of someone on the side of the road, they would watch the baseball go up and then kind of go in an arc with the truck and then land back in your hands, right? So the trajectory of the baseball in one reference frame is straight up and straight down. The trajectory of the baseball in the other reference frame is a parabola, right? Both people would agree that this is occurring due to a gravitational field and the forces and everything make sense. It's just that what they observe is different, right? Same thing here. One observer says magnetic uh, fields. The other observer says electric fields. And Einstein realized that had to be the case. And that, that these two had to just be different things observed from different reference frames. And that was apparently his starting point 
because he specifically says at the beginning of his paper, I'm just going to pull it up because why not? So the paper is called On the Electrodynamics of Moving Bodies. This is one of the best books ever written that it's hard to read a little bit, but um, let's, we're just going to read the beginning of this. We're going to read the first, uh, where is the, I think we can get through this like by just by reading the first, first paragraph here because there's some interesting things here. This is the opening of the paper on special relativity. It's not called special relativity, but this is the paper where he developed special relativity. So he starts off talking about Maxwell. He says, it is known that Maxwell's electrodynamics, as usually understood at the present time, this was 1905, when applied to moving bodies, leads to asymmetries which do not appear to be inherent in the phenomena. This is what we were just talking about. Like, one person says electric field, one person says magnetic field. So asymmetries that do not appear in the phenomena. Take, for example, the reciprocal electrodynamic action of a magnet and a conductor. The observable phenomenon here depends only on the relative motion of the conductor and the magnet, whereas the customary view draws a sharp distinction between the two cases in which either one or either one or the other of these bodies in motion. For if the magnet is in motion and the conductor at rest, there arises in the neighborhood of the magnet an electric field with a certain definite energy, producing a current at the places where parts of the conductor is situated. But if the magnet is stationary and the conductor is in motion, no electric field arises in the neighborhood of the magnet. In the conductor, however, we find an electromotive force to which in itself there is no corresponding energy that gives rise. Assuming equality of relative motion in the two cases discussed, the electric currents of the same path and intensity as those produced by the electric forces in the former case. Examples of this sort, together with unsuccessful attempts to discover any motion of the Earth relative to the light medium, this is the ether stuff, suggests that the phenomena of electrodynamics as well as the mechanics possess no properties corresponding to the idea of absolute rest. They suggest rather that, as has already been shown to the first order in small quantities, the same laws of electrodynamics and optics will be valid for all uh, frames of reference for which the equations of mechanics hold good. And then he kind of goes in develops everything but but i mean just notice what the very first thing he's talking about here is and he's specifically talking about the motion of a magnet relative to a solenoid right that from one perspective it, it makes sense from another perspective there's kind of an unexplainable thing that's going on and um i think what's the most impressive about all of this and part of the reason why it wasn't discussed in this textbook ash is that the laws of electricity and magnetism do not have to be changed for relativity because it's it's hard coded in right it's hard coded in that that a moving electric field is actually a magnetic field like we already we we had already given a name to the moving electric field basically we call it a magnetic field does that make sense that's what i mean that it's hard coded in it was already there when we observed all the phenomenon of electricity and magnetism it, it just like by observing a magnetic field we were observing an electric field that was moving so that's where um, you know, so, all right, kind of got off on a tangent here, but this is probably the best time in this course to really talk about this stuff because, uh, because after all, we've, we've already developed all of Maxwell's equations and we're really just dealing with kind of like little things here and there. So, okay. So we've been lecturing since, uh, it's like an hour and it's been, been about an hour. So I should probably stop right there.